awesome. I just gotta pull up my thing in the background here. All right, hello everyone. Uh, you are at the TLC Professional Development Series every Wednesday at noon. We're here and it's awesome. And we're really excited about all of our events. Today is no exception. Next week, I was talking about next week before this week. Next week, we're gonna have a teaching chat. For those of you who haven't been at a teaching chat before, I'm gonna have questions. I'm gonna have stuff that I wanna think about. It's almost like the TLC office hours or student hours. You can bring concerns, you can bring questions, you can contribute, you can participate, or you can sit back and listen to the few of us who wanna be vocal, offer our thoughts. But we're really excited for that. But think about what you wanna do with this time next week, because if you don't have a plan, I absolutely will have one. Um, for coming to these events, you can earn a TLC professional development certificate, either as a GTA um, or as a faculty or staff member. And my colleague, Noah Rankin, has just dropped that information into the chat. Also, if you do things to improve teaching on campus, not just for yourself, but for others too, you can potentially be identified as a TLC fellow. And that would be really super cool and fun. And you can see that information at that link as well. Today, I am so excited because I have lots of favorite people on this campus, but Tracy Brimhall is definitely one of my favorite people on this campus. Uh, Tracy and I had the opportunity to work together on AQ, which was the Academy of College University Educators course about teaching people to be excellent teaching which means that we get to pair up and lead faculty through an online course over an entire academic year, and it was fantastic. And I don't know if it would have been anywhere near as fast, fantastic without having an excellent teacher like Dr. Brimhall to be working on that with. So we are so excited that Dr. Brimhall is gonna share her opinions today on her talk called The Student Body, colon, Reconstructing the Classroom for Student Wellbeing. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Brimhall. Thank you, Dr. Saucier. Um, I'm going to um, go ahead and switch uh, to screen share um, and pull up my slides because I did get this beautiful um, slide layout by Googling free slides um, from, from Google for Google Slides to talk about the student body and restructuring the classroom for student well-being. So I have often thought about how to put knowledge into students. I think about their brains a lot, how they learn, what ways I can find new kinds of engagement for their brains. Um, and I also think about their emotional well being, but I haven't thought about how that's all tied um, to their physical well being um, and how caring about students' um, ability to learn intellectually. Um, we often talk about emotional components, but we don't think about the fact that they are not just a mind, they are also a meat tube. We're all in here, I've got my water handy. We were talking about tending to our physical needs beforehand. Um, I've got my water right here just because I got to worry about hydrating while I talk. Some people might have lunches in front of them and that's great. I want you to have to tend to your physical needs during this talk as well. Um, but I'd also been teaching literature of the body for years and hadn't actually thought about my students' bodies. Um, even though we talked about illness and ways in which the physical health affects mental health and vice versa, um, I hadn't actually thought about what does that mean about my classroom space, um, movement I create in the classroom and other ways I can be thinking about physical need um, within my students. Um, but why should we care? Um, well, my Garmin tells me to move every hour. Um, and if I don't, it alerts me. And every, for every 15 minutes after that, if I'm not moving, it's mad at me. Um, and I, I looked this up of why Garmin does that. And it has to do with our metabolisms. And also it makes us our workouts less, less effective if we're not mobile throughout the day. Um, and if we have a 75 minute class, my watch is going off several times and I just really want everybody's smart watches out there just to be doing okay. So I look for opportunities to create movement. Um, it's also part of the National Educators Association. I know that's K through 12, but a lot of practices that I think are super effective in K through 12 classrooms could totally be applied to college um, about how often um, a learner's got to move around. Also, my doctor in my latest wellness exam um, quizzed me on my sleeping and eating habits. We are not in charge of our students sleeping eight hours. They really need to take responsibility for that. But so much of other forms of well being um, have to do with whether or not we're taking care of some of our basic needs. As we know in our disciplines, often when we go back to the basics, um, we can find some great answers. And I think that's true for our physical well being as well. Also, just metaphysically, this has been with me. It's been on my board in my office for since 2019. 
Um, I was watching a documentary on, um, be because of the anniversary of the moon landing, I was watching a space documentary and astronaut Ken Bowersox was aboard the International Space Station when the Columbia came back um, into the atmosphere and broke up and everybody he just spent weeks with doing projects with on the ISS, um, of course died. And what he said, you know, still in space was that the hardest part of grieving was the physical part. And it made me think about how much we might need gravity for our own emotions. Um, because it turns out that um, astronauts can't cry in the regular way. It just, tears will just form a ball in the corners of their eyes and they have to flick it open like they can't get their, they have to pull their tears out um, in a way that we don't. So that is the more metaphysical thing answer. But I just think that our bodies, a lot goes on in our bodies that we tend to think of, um, I tend to think of it as just the thing that's moving my mind around. Um, but of course, my emotions, my ability to process things, um, all of that is going on in my body at the same time as well. And that's going on for our students. So that's my metaphysical answer. So today I'm going to talk about four different ideas, um, physical space, how we can affect the classroom setup for the comfort of our students and ourselves physical movement, um, ways in which we can have actual movement in our classroom, thinking about things about language's impact on the body and how language can be activating um, for someone's emotions, could also be de-escalating. Um, and then I just have a few et cetera ideas. At the end of each section, after I overwhelm you with ideas, I do have like a slide that says, here's the simplest version of this. If this interests you in thinking about how to implement this in a classroom space, this is the easiest version of this idea, as well as I double dog dare you, here is the complicated radical version of this idea. So physical spaces. Um, and yes, this is a picture of an elementary classroom of everybody sitting on these exercise balls. Um, I saw these in my son's third grade classroom. And it did get me thinking about like, wow, they really get, you know, people got to wiggle around, um, people got to move. And just for young learners, they recognize this as a need more than we do um, in older ages. We haven't really rethought our classrooms since the Industrial Revolution, I guess, um, and haven't thought about maybe a physical, physical space as a need to move. Um, however, I recognize that this teacher also got to put up that fun, colorful board and pick out these things, and many of the classroom spaces that we are in are not under our control. Um, still have ideas, though. Um, from an interior designer, real comfort, physical, and visual is vital in every room. So I just wanted to say um, first about our own care for ourselves. Many of us might have, as I am standing right now at a standing desk, I have the option of sitting down or standing up while working. We've thought about that in terms of workspace, comfort and health in a worker way in many offices and cubicles, they're thinking about we need ergonomic um, keyboards and all these other things, but we don't extend that you know, again, into our student, for our students. But thinking about that as an option, um, thinking about whether or not we have, I, I did turn on my light for this talk, but I usually use just natural light or um, lamps. In studies about trauma-informed classroom, they do recommend dim lights. Um, and I do, I think it might be um, not a working thermostat, but I do have a thermostat in my office. It doesn't seem to listen to me, but I should have control over my physical comfort um, in my office as well. The other maybe more radical idea or that you haven't thought of is I have Legos out for students when they come. Um, if anybody's waiting for me or if somebody needs a fidget toy or something while they're hanging out in my office, um, I do have the Queer Eye apartment Lego set for them to play with and they can um, give a Lego a little makeover with the minifigs in there. Should should they need something to just be distracted by or play with while we're talking. But thinking about the classroom spaces ourselves, um, the lights, um, we often can, we might have multiple lights, which is in the classroom. This could be possible. I usually turn off a couple of the fluorescents in one of the classrooms I'm in right now, um, just to, to bring down the level. And they actually asked me to turn all of them off um, yesterday because they felt more comfortable just with the natural light than having the fluorescents on. Um, 
for temperature, again, I know we often don't have control over that, but some of us have small ACs in the room. It was one of the first things my students said to me the first day of class this semester was, could I turn off the AC because the room was freezing. Um, they were in their shorts and the small AC in the window was set to 60. Um, I've noticed um, in a new classroom space that uh, a lot of people are having trouble seeing the screen because the projector, the size of the projector doesn't seem to be as big as it was the first time I taught this class. So a lot of my slides aren't showing up well. But thinking about um, what contrasts you're using, what font size you're using, um, is your screen visible? And I recommend sitting somewhere in your classroom, like if you get there early, to sit there, pop on your slide, turn on the lights, see what it look where you, you're standing, where that looks like for your students at some point. Um, and are your slides legible? Can they, are they comfortable? What does that look like? It doesn't happen all the time, but I've also used a video background of a coffee shop um, as like our backdrop one day of like we just had it was it was a rainy coffee shop too. So we had the sounds of rain. We had this background for one of our events. Um, somebody told me they needed windows um, in a classroom, and I think that's a COVID reason as well, but I teach in rooms without windows. Um, so if you do need some ambiance, a tree moving in the background, it might seem silly, but it is also, I went to a friend's office today who had um, just a fake decal on her wall that looked like a window so she could feel like she was looking outside. Um, but just thinking about the options in our, in our classroom spaces in which our ability to change things is limited. Um, also, if you are comfortable with the idea, do you let students, if you're, they're working individually, wear earbuds? If it's in small group sessions, are you open to playing? soothing background music. Um, when I've taught online, I had a music, a study music water cooler where I had, um, I like the soundtrack to Avatar, to put other like music that I think they might wanna hit play on with long playlists while they're doing their work. Um, but other things again that like, we know people like to use study music. Some people find the music soothing, things to, um, that might be affecting their ability to be comfortable and therefore their ability to focus. When we're hungry, when we're cold, when we're all of these other things, it is harder to focus on things that we need to do. So my simplest change is just ask if they're comfortable. Like, how's the temperature, you guys? Do you need me to turn off the AC or up the AC? Or can you see the screen back there? Is the font size okay? Just ask if they can see it. Ask how they, if they're comfortable ask, just ask. And that's the small, it's a very easy thing to do. Um, not too many words, not that much classroom time. Um, but if you wanted to level up and if you had the type of class structure where you could, how much could you reorganize, reshape, move around the tables or create based on their preferences, how they wanna organize. If you have them working in small groups or teams, what's the way where as soon as they arrive into class, they could be moving the desks in these circles, in these clusters, in these spaces where they sort of have their sort of group area in the room or ways in which their needs for the ability to see things, feel comfortable, all of those kinds of things are attended to um, and that they give you input on how, what they need. Physical movement. Um, again, those garments are going off and we, we all need to be moving our meat tubes around. Um, and this came from a letter that Einstein wrote to his son. And I know this is like more um, philosophical, but I also agree in the physical sense. Um, life is like a bicycle. To keep your balance, you must keep moving. Um, so thinking about one of the things I like about being a teacher is I do have a lot of energy, so I get to move around a lot. I'm passing out papers. I'm writing on the board. My, I am sort of keeping my Garmin quiet. Um, I'm visiting the small groups when they're working in small groups. I often sometimes try and like hit all corners of the room, be walking this way while talking, walking over here while talking, and just trying to move. Or, so there's no dead spot in the classroom. Um, just trying to get everywhere in the classroom. But also thinking about as we leave, um, I saw people trying to, um, on, on Twitter and other social media areas talking about how do we change office hours if they're not being used. So right now I'm trying to do walking office minutes. So I called out different students to walk out with me each class and just check in. Um, sometimes the students are really need to check in with, other times it's just, how are things going? Um, where are you headed to next? Like just personalizing, getting to know them, but also maybe checking in. 
And then if students do have a need, we can walk back to my office together, then they've found it um, without having to look through the confusing building I teach, I'm in, um, and then they're there. Um, thinking about also us as teachers outside that space, I'm missing noon yoga right now and it's worth it. I love hanging out with DSAUCE over here and talking about pedagogy, but that's normally where I take myself uh, Wednesdays at noon, that's why I'm not here. Um, but we've got this great rec center, we could walk in the university gardens, I made a date with another professor to go on a walk this morning to stretch our legs and catch up. Um, I also recommend office dance parties. I only grade three papers before I take a three minute dance break because then I'm like dropping some nice oxytocin through here. I'm moving my body, keeping my garment quiet because you can't, a six hour grading session is exhausting on so many levels. And then I have a mood boost and paper five and six aren't suffering from the fact that I've read all those other papers and I'm getting grouchy. Um, I've moved around, I've danced, I've elevated my mood. Um, and then I sit down to grade again. My other point here is just that I'm always looking for a way to outsource things in my life. I can outsource my meal planning to HelloFresh or Dobro's in town, or I can ask somebody else to cover that. I can ask Goodwitch or Merry Maids. I can get somebody else to clean my house. I can even hire someone to walk my dog, but I can't hire someone to walk me. Um, with our physical movement and the needs for that that we have, that's one part of our life we definitely can't ask somebody else to do for us. We could hire a trainer, but we're the ones that still have to ultimately make our smartwatches be quiet um, and keep physically moving throughout our day. So that's, you know, I too am trying to simplify my life, but one thing I can't outsource to somebody else um, is my, my need, my body's need for physical movement. So possible changes you could have to the classroom, um, if it works for your style of class, is having them come up to the board to write. Um, I'm a huge fan of getting students to work in small groups, so getting them um, to move around. Even for things like pair share, I sometimes don't want them just to turn. I understand in a large lecture hall, turning to pair share is all you can maybe work with at a moment, but often for pair share, I always have a deck of cards in my bag. Um, so then I might pass out cards and the, the diamonds and the hearts and the clubs and the spades have to find each other to do pair share or group work. Um, I have other ways I use the deck of cards too, but again, getting students to move around like that. Um, also up there at the top with stations, sometimes I set up stations of activities um, that are outside the hallway of what we're doing like we did a speed dating activity. And so we were out in the hall yesterday. I also like those big whiteboard sheets that are out in a, in a hallway and they move around from station to station asking different questions, answering different questions, just to get them again, moving out outside and around and then coming back. Um, my stretching wait time thing is we often as teachers will try and significantly pause to wait for those quiet students to you know, speak. Um, but this is if you are like, okay, go ahead and stretch something. And in the once you're done getting both your arms and maybe a nice neck stretch, I want you to tell me this. And then you can do your stretches that you need. And then you can be like, okay, what'd you get to? And that gives them actual time to think. And while they're actually thinking, they could actually be stretching. I had a student who would just stand up and start stretching. And I was like, okay, maybe we can all, <laughs> all do this. But I love that they knew that that's what they needed and just did it for themselves. Um, I once um, witnessed an accident on my way to class and I got to class very frazzled. And so I just modeled for them that I said, I need a minute to calm down because I'm very, you know, not a good sight of blood person. And I was very shook up. And so I said, I can focus on you, but I need four breaths first. And I just put my hand over my heart because I was told once that that helps. And I did a four, four, four count breaths. And then I said, okay, I feel better. What do we have on deck today? And I said, if anybody wanted to do it with me, they were welcome to, but modeling things that I think are good practices, um, deep breath. We know things that um, in terms of trauma or anxiety, people, who, uh, anyone who dissociates, things like that, being grounded in our bodies is the thing that helps. So um, I've never led meditation personally in my class, though I know people who have. So I put that out there as a suggestion. Um, I also, in the pandemic, became very aware of um, how, did, how much we were all struggling with being inside constantly, on screens constantly. And when I was teaching during the pandemic fully on Zoom, um, I would often 
tell us all to put our screens on black and go ahead and stretch. Mid-class, I always had a stretch break because we were all just stuck there like gazing at screens. Um, and that was one of the things that I incorporated with online teaching was just built-in stretch breaks. The simplest change that I think you could do if you're thinking about physical movement and the need to move around is just ask if they need the break. Of like, how's everyone doing? Do we need a water break? Yes, I did. Just tending to my stuff. Um, asking if they need that break. Um, asking if they need it. Energy seems kind of low. Do we want to take a break real quick, stand up and stretch some stuff and then get resume? But asking people if their needs are tended to is the simplest way I think you could do it. Um, one of my favorite things to do is to use the university as a classroom. Um, I love to take them on activities that get them outside. Um, tomorrow, we're going to be doing laps around the building or depending on mobility differences um, or interests, um, picnic blankets to sit down, um, doing rounds of questions where we walk around the building with, it was a book about letters, so we're reading letters with questions in them and walking around in pairs, doing pair share in a mobile way. Um, I also have activities that get us into the library as much as I can, done the Legos in the architecture building, over to Waters to check out those insects, found a way to incorporate the university tree walk into an activity that we did, but wanting to make sure that students know where stuff is on their university campus or utilizing the services, um, especially in the library, um, through assignments and things like that. But I'm constantly thinking about ways to get us out of the classroom for all 16 weeks that we're stuck there um, and trying to tie our lessons and our assignments into things that are experiences as well. Um, because I also believe that as riveting as my talk on the Oxford comma is, my lectures might probably don't stick with people the way an assignment that is also an experience sticks with people. Um, so I do try and create experiences around many lesson plans um, and many assignments. And to model what I'm talking about, I'm going to pause to do a stretch break because I'm at a standing desk and you can do a dark screen and do it. I'll just keep my screen on. Getting a nice quad stretch right now down there. I'm gonna do this side. Oh, it feels good though. It feels really good. And that is me doing yoga on an iceberg. I was pregnant and it was a very bad choice, um, but I did it. The rest of this is all solid advice, but don't do yoga on an iceberg or an ice flow, I guess, technically, anyway. Okay, that marks midway through my talk. So now language. You might be thinking, but you're talking about the body. Why are you talking about language? Why is that important? And But I am an English professor. So I do believe Ursula K. Le Guin, the very famous sci-fi writer, when she says words are events, they do things, things. They transform both speaker and hearer. And I would, I'm very much on this team. Um, I did independent editorial work with somebody and I noticed a lot of passive voice in their writing, in their poems. And I said, you're always a, a witness. It's always passive. What if your language, what if you made these active verbs? What if you did this? And she wrote me back and she said, I changed one and I felt electricity go through my body. Um, that just turning language into something more active. She's like, I've always felt I had to be quiet to take up less space. And it was, I felt it in my body when I took up space in this other way or was active even in a language way. Um, but thinking about things that are gonna come up on the next slide too, we know things um, like using somebody's pronouns is gender affirming and how important things like that are for mental health and stuff like that. But I think our language is important. The way we talk about ourselves, the way we talk to our students is really important. Um, somebody told me the other day about how they announced to their students that they were nervous to try something. And their students were sort of odd that a, that a teacher would say like, oh yeah, I, I've never done this lesson plan before. And I, I'm kind of worried that it won't go as well as I hope. And just like, oh, okay. Of just acknowledging how you feel or acknowledging something about yourself um, is really important. I realized while I was preparing for this talk, I hadn't told my students why the class I was teaching was important to me. Um, and articulating something vulnerable of like, yeah, this 
teaching literature of the body is important to me because I lost my mom young and I still think about the following things, um, which is part of why I think, you know, pick the books that I pick and ask you the questions I ask is even when we lose somebody, our relationship with them does not end. So that's why it's important to me. Um, and just articulating something about why your class is important and that connection that you have to articulate why a class is meaningful to you as well um, is a way to connect with our students. But alongside that as well as like, I think it's so powerful when um, teachers especially who are clearly accomplished at what they do, tell students about their failures um, of like, did you fail a class in the discipline you now teach? Um, what were the ways in which you, you know, how many times did you submit that paper before it was accepted? Or how many times did you apply to grad school and not get it? What are the things that you could acknowledge about your own humanness in whatever way that feels comfortable to you? Um, but I think students sometimes feel more and more, I see a lot of anxiety about not doing things perfectly um, and how much it, for promoting growth mindset, does it really help if we're like, hey, I struggled with this as well. Um, I also show students, um, I pick up a new hobby every year. And so I sh show students the beginning and end of 100 days of practicing something new. Um, and we spend even more time than 100 days together. Um, so what are the changes that we think we could see in, in the work that we're doing in class when I show them like, here's how, here's my first watercolor and here's a hundred days in, um, and looking at all of the differences that practice, how much practice can help uh, with those things. And also if it works in your discipline, doing the activities or assignments alongside your students. Um, so I think, you know, also modeling that you're thinking about these questions as well, or, you know, for, for me, sometimes it, changes if I'm doing something in partners sometimes there's an odd number in a class and then I become their discussion partner or we you know do that that walk together we do that lego project together we head to the library together whatever that is to sort of it's not I give the assignment and then I don't worry about whether or not it works I engage in that as well and make sure it's working um so then also thinking about possible changes to classrooms um, in terms of languages. Um, I personally was only uh, made aware of the language of content notice rather than content warning. Um, I like neutral language, and so I prefer content notice um, over a content warning, which is what I had been using. Um, I'm just like, hey, if you, you know, it's not going to be a trigger or an activating thing for everybody, but just content notice this contains this sort of material. Um, as I mentioned before, being affirming and learning and using your students' pronouns and thinking about accessible um, language. So if you have images online in Canvas, are you using alt text to make sure a screen reader can read your alt text or can read the image? Um, if you're showing videos in class or PowerPoint recordings, are you using closed captioning in your video? Um, thinking about ways in which you're accommodating language needs for your students. We also at K-State don't actually have like an exact language guide, but there are lots available through NIH, through um, other places. I made a mistake in my class this semester where I said something about a person suffering from postpartum. And I said, my bad, I just used incorrect language, everyone. We don't use suffering with depression. We say a person living with depression. Again, language neutrality, especially with things regarding physical, mental health, um, also identities, you wanna use person first language. Um, so I just, I corrected myself and I do show them, um, especially because a lot of work um, in my class for literature of the body, right? Um, covers some of these things, but also in classes where anything about identity comes up, um, having a, a resource or a language guide to send them to for how to talk about um, people's identities if they don't know how. Um, but so I, I made the mistake and corrected myself because I don't know if they knew, but we do talk about language neutrality um, in my body as literature class because it's really important that people who are likely going into health professions that they keep um, health language neutral. And finally, I often recommend journaling. Um, I know somebody in art history at a different institution who last year um, with, you know, when everybody's still 
really deep into some of their COVID blues, had students start with five minutes of journaling at the beginning of every class and said she wanted to, them to put all of their worries, their concerns, their heaviness into the writing so that then they could focus on the lecture. That does mean giving up five minutes of very limited time. Sometimes it feels like we have with our students, but we also know it's right there that Penna Baker studies, as far as I know and have read and I can be corrected, but that when the initial results came out that only 10 minutes of free writing, journaling, um, improved physical and emotional health, um, that it's been repeated. They're like, there's absolutely no way that's true. And then repeat studies keep showing like, actually, yeah, it seems like just 10 minutes of journaling a day can do a lot for us for getting the chaos in the mind out of the body and into some language. Um, and again, as a believer in the idea that language is powerful and meaningful and that words are events, I am a big fan of um, take, take what you're going through. And I do have a journaling assignment, but it's not something I spend class time in, but I do have a journaling assignment um, that I, I ask them to do. Again, trying to like use that as a way for, for students to learn to process some things and not carry everything inside them all the time. So again, the simplest thing is always just ask um, of like, these are my content notices for things in class. Are there any other content notices that you feel would be helpful for you? Um, anything that you need me to accommodate for you? Or um, how's that, you know, how's the screen reader working? Um, is there enough alt text there? But just checking in of like, are you, can you see the closed captions um, or other things, right? Just making sure that the things you're already making an effort to do, how's that working? Is that, can you see that? Um, do you need notices of different things? Um, but I do also, I try and teach them those things. I try and make it part of class assignments, um, learning things um, like we just did a photo essay on a disability activist and learning other ways in which we can be um, like make access more common in the things we're already doing like alt text on images for things like social media, using caps on hashtags so screen readers can read those hashtags, um, things like that. So I try and make it part of our classroom practice or even an assignment so that I teach them those things so that a lot of um, things about communication and access just happen more naturally for them and build good habits so they don't even have to think about whether or not they're doing certain things. They're just naturally doing things that make their language more accessible. They're building journaling into their life so it becomes part of how they process everything. Um, but yeah, trying to build good habits and teach them good practices for their own lives. So this is my final section on just other ideas um, that I have that I feel like relate to the mind-body connection um, and how thinking about our students as holistic human beings um, with a, a variety of needs, not just intellectual, educational needs, um, other things we might be doing. This quote I've been um, carrying around for a while and trying to find its source um, is a maybe because I'm not sure if it's Peg Bracken or not, but the uh, quote is the same heat that melts butter hardens the egg. Thinking about the amount of stress that I use, I've made my classes a little bit lighter since COVID of the stress that I used to feel, the, the pressure, the metrics that I used to use are no longer the metrics I'm using. I would rather do a little bit less and make sure they really get it um, because the stress that used to just like, ah, oh, they're pulling, they're doing it, they're crushing it. I do feel like I can't expect quite as much of them or even myself is fine. Um, but thinking about it's the a certain amount of stress helps us grow, helps us strive, but that same amount of stress can also make somebody fall apart. So thinking about um, modifying where I think the stress levels are in my class. Um, so other radical ideas, I've made uh, homework active, especially this was a big pivot in the pandemic. Um, I made, uh, there were walking poems and there were all sorts of things I was having people do. Um, for myself and I know others had started to struggle with reading and the ability to focus for longer term, longer times. So I tried to use more podcasts um, or YouTube videos, right? Something to listen to while they washed dishes, while they walked their dogs, while they did those other things. And also got really into like suggesting PDF readers so they could just have a PDF reader read the, the essay, the story, the thing for class. Again, while they, you know, took a shower, drove to back from Kansas City and seeing their parents, whatever it was, um, 
and which you can get those as apps, um, but to make sure that that the material for class, there was a variety of ways to receive information. We also, as an institution, started scheduling mental health break days, but I, I kind of just do it now anyway. Um, there's a couple of days in a semester that I make. I'm going to do a midterm review. If you want to come, you can come, but there's no attendance policy. There's what I've like, I've got a plan for the day, but you don't. If you need the break, if you need to sleep in, that's what you should do for yourself. Um, so I do have some scheduled rests or lighter days sort of built into my schedule um, so that it's they can just take a they can just take a deep breath um, because 16 weeks is a long time to go really hard. Um, so I do try and create these moments of, of rest within the semester. Um, and also, if you haven't considered some of these questions about physical movement, physical space, language access, these kinds of things, um, we in a few weeks, midterms will be here, yikes. Um, but you can put that, if you do a midterm check-in where you ask about how things are going, you can put a question about space and movement in the midterm evaluation and sort of take stock of like, okay, this is a thing I could pivot to do more of, less of. So you can check in with them at that time. Um, if there's you know, a piece of this presentation that you're like, I'm curious how that would go over in my class. So I think, Conclusion from all of this uh, stuff I'm trying to toss out at you, the simplest change would be to just pick something to tweak. Um, there was a lot of little bullet points out there and maybe something resonated. You're like that. Yeah, I should check. I should check that out. Or I should at least ask, like, is the room too warm? Cool. How are y'all doing? Um, but find something that you can think of to do that makes you more aware of physical need within your students um, for the rest of the semester. And the leveling up thing to consider is I often have a checklist that I'm going through as I like redo a syllabus even that I've already taught. I'm like, oh, yeah, that lesson plan, that one didn't work. I'm going to fix that. Or I really wanted to make this assignment involve the library. So I'm going to I'm changing this assignment this time. But I have like a checklist that I go through um, and think about what is uh, something you can add on that checklist that makes you include thinking about your students in this holistic way, not just intellectual need. And again, many of us are already thinking about emotional needs since the like sort of dire mental health um, moment that we've sort of had since COVID um, has come up. But I do think a lot of that is related to our physical bodies. Um, astronaut Ken Bauer socks saying that the grief is really hard on the body and it's really hard you know, without gravity to grieve, um, but thinking about how their bodies have needs, everything from water and sleep um, to, you know, making their garments be quiet. Um, but that a lot is going on and our bodies are processing a lot of physical uh, things, emotional things. And I do think most of, many of us get great ideas while driving or in the shower or working out or while we're moving our bodies, great ideas often come to us. So finding ways to incorporate movement um, into learning, it's not a distraction from learning. It's not that they're not focused because they're not sitting. Um, I think it can help them in some ways focus better. Um, and all I'm at, I, I think some of those simplest changes might be even some of the best ones, but thinking about what we know about habits and how small changes build, you know, big movements in our life um, by just tweaking small things. Um, even Tolstoy agrees with me, true life is lived when tiny changes occur. I want to make sure this slide appears, though I will quick hit next, so that anybody watching the recording, if they want to check out one of the sources that I used to build my suggestions so that it's not just some you know, touchy-feely English teacher says we should, there's lots of resources that say these things are good. Um, and um, if in our Q&A time, we don't get to something that you wanted to talk about. Um, my email is there, or you could walk over to my office at 111. We could walk to the gardens together and stretch our legs um, or any of that stuff. But that's where you can find me um, should you want to find me, uh, my email, my office, if you had questions, um, if you're watching a recording later, or if you don't get to it in the Q&A. Um, I'd love to, if you try one of these things, I'd love to hear from you. Um, and I, I'm sure we'll look at the Q&A real fast, but I also want to, I, I, like I said, I Googled to get these very, very pretty slides and this is their slide 
um, that acknowledges that this is their creation and not mine. So I want to make sure I do that too. So I'm going to click stop share now um, and join you in our little face box community um, and check out um, some of the first comment I see is uh, from Katie Sigmund, um, who said, when we came back from COVID, I started doing a one minute meditation to start each class. I check in with the students after a few weeks and every semester, the vast majority wish to continue it. I love that. And I think, yeah, I think for lots of us too, COVID just really woke us up about some of these other things we can or in one minute, that's not long to spend of class time you know, tending to these physical and emotional needs the students also have, and just being holistic. I used to um, worry that it was being paternalistic, and I was like, being someone's mom, or like, over not staying in my lane as a teacher, and kind of crossing boundaries by, you know, referencing some of these things, or including some of these things, but I think students do like, um, somebody thanked me last semester for having a really human class, and I was like, that's my favorite compliment um, I've ever gotten as a teacher. And I want to continue to make sure all of my classrooms stay really human because um, I really value that. So are there any questions? No, I've solved all of your problems. And you're like, I've, I've attended, I get it now. Everything's going to be better and different. So, so Tracy, having, having been in a lot of these conversations over the years and things like that, the question I have is, how do we convince people these are things important enough to consider, given that their classes are so overwhelmed with content already? Um, it, it, it doesn't look like what traditional education might be. It's not the kinds of questions we often think about or have been trained to think about. So how do you kind of overcome resistance to us to people saying these are things that are on the students and we shouldn't care? I mean, I also, when I first thought about this, a student posted online that they had back problems and they blamed us as English professors for not telling them to stretch more. And I was like, wow, I don't feel like it is my job to tell my, I can't put them to bed. I can't put a straw in their mouth and make them hydrate. I can't do these things, but I don't think that my job as a professor is just content communication. Um, I think that's the same, but I think it's also a generational change a little bit too, as in when we go to doctors, we also expect to be listened to. Um, we expect a conversation, we expect to build a relationship, um, not just take two and call me in the morning. It's not I think a younger generation isn't looking for a transaction as much as it used to be um, much more, this is the role of this, this is the role of this. But I also think some of these changes, especially small changes, one, things about language access, you should just be doing anyway. Um, these are things that are really important. Um, and it's not just about equations or, um, you know, war and peace, read it. Um, it shouldn't be about just content, but about um, thinking about our students as human beings as well. And it's not our job to be their therapists, or again, I'm not putting them to bed at night and making sure they get eight hours. Um, but I do think like, all right, let's take a stretch break. I feel like I need, um, I think I need that. Um, I think it's really helpful and useful. And if we pay attention to our own needs and then just model that we need that too, of like, I need a water break. Um, who needs a stretch break? I'm feeling the need to move around again. I think that we can just, we'll feel better because we're taking better care of ourselves. And I think hopefully they can feel better as well. We can't do it all for them. Of course, they're human beings and they get to be responsible for those things. But a stretch break in class, a one minute meditation, uh, acknowledgement of accessibility of the, the teaching materials we're using. I think all of those are really important. Thank you. A question from the chat is, what change has been the most difficult for you to implement and why? Um, thinking, I mean, just acknowledging my students as bodies to begin with. I said, like, it makes me feel weird to say, we're gonna talk about our students' bodies. That's weird. Um, I am used to thinking about them as 
as minds, as people I'm trying to, I'm trying to work with their, their thoughts. I'm trying to like connect with them intellectually. Um, and again, I have considered their emotions for a long time, considered them as emotional beings and thinking about how those needs might be showing up in the classroom. But just thinking about the fact that they're a body, um, I haven't thought about my students as bodies before, which is really silly. But um, but in, in large part, I guess because I didn't think any of that was my lane. They're you know it's their job to put themselves to bed, their parents' job to make sure they're um, they know how to do their own laundry. Um, that it's other people's jobs to do other things, including students' jobs to do those things. But I think just feeling acknowledging that it could be a little bit more of my role was the biggest barrier and in just acknowledging that. Um, and sometimes I did a, a station activity the other day. And when I said we would do another one, I got a groan and I was like, pulled them aside and was like, hey, what's the, what's the, con what about this did you hate and what can I do differently? And they said, oh, I'm just old, I don't like moving. <laughs> They're younger than me, um, but uh, they were like, you're not doing anything wrong. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna alternate sitting station, standing station. And they were like, I like that. So I took their feedback and adapted, but for the most part, I have not been met with resistance. And a lot of times they like the fact that they're moving around and I've received that on midterm evaluations. So mostly from their end, I've received positive feedback on incorporating these things. But yeah, just kind of thinking about them as bodies and like, what does their body need is a weird question for me to get used to. Um, thinking about physical need. Um, and I, I think I couldn't, I couldn't compete in the Olympics of repression, but definitely could play in the minor leagues. So I often ignore my own needs, my own hunger cues, my own other, you know, needs. I always come last in my life. So just even acknowledging, working on acknowledging my own stuff so that I could acknowledge, realize that they probably need that too. If I'm feeling it and I repress a lot, then they probably are for 10 minutes past due for a break because I'm finally acknowledging it. So just working on sensing my own cues better too, so that I can be better at knowing when they might need something. So I, I do want to alert people. There's a fairly robust chat going on about, you know, different things that people are doing. There was also a question about where to get some resources. And some of those questions are getting answered in there too. Um, one of the questions I kind of want to ask Tracy is that we, we talked about compassion fatigue. We talked about emotional labor in this series on a number of occasions. So is taking on this kind of added role in providing guidance, leadership, caring, is it sustainable? Is it, is it something that is, is just going to kind of interfere with the you know, lack of resources we already have? And if so, how do we make it sustainable? How do we make it fulfilling? Um, so for me, um, I guess part of the trick and one of the things I noticed when I was preparing for the talk is that I went, I started adding slides about for your offices. Think about, can you paint those walls? Can you hang a nice print? What about a nice little corner lamp, right? Like thinking about if my office feels more like a place I want to be, how much does that change my mood um, when the temperature is right and there's nice lighting and I feel good? Um, it's thinking about like, also everybody who's at this talk or watches it later, I was thinking about like, what? What, what's going to make you feel good in that classroom? What's going to make you feel good in your office? What's going to make you feel good in your life? For me, it's not just a projection outwards on what they need. I'm also trying to figure out how to take better care of myself because COVID wore me out. I'm out of energy. <laughs> um, I, you know, had a harder time focusing. I found I needed to sleep longer because I just wasn't recovering very well. So I was looking for ways also to take better care of myself. And then also by extension, letting some of those practices be modeled in front of students or talk about those things that I learned about taking better care of myself. Not an, especially when I can tie it to things that we're doing in class. Um, I'm just like, okay, four, three deep breaths. I want you to think about this and measuring it in terms of breaths in terms instead of time. Um, of just like, if they're focused on their breath, what do they think about differently? Or if they do these things, how do they, but just trying to like tweak things into pedagogical practices that are mindful of it. But ultimately I'm just trying to take good care of myself too. So it's not just about them, but also how do I extend the ways I'm trying to be better about uh, work-life balance, about catching up with a friend, walking rather than, you know, eating, uh, eat food is also a good, you need to take breaks, but just, you know, trying to make sure I'm doing my movement stuff. Um, but yeah, I'm just, 
trying to take care of myself. And so I might be fatigued at providing compassion to others, but if I'm taking good care of myself, I think it makes one, I'm more available emotionally because my cup is full um, for others' needs, but also figuring out like, huh, that kind of helped me. Is there a way that I could bring that into the classroom in a way that makes sense pedagogically? Thank you for that. Uh, in the in the comments, people are kind of talking about like the hierarchy of needs, right? You have to take care of yourself before you take care of others. Um, actually, uh, the TLC team for a little while have been doing some research project on a hierarchy of teaching needs, um, the things that need to happen before you can self-actualize as a teacher in your classroom. So at some point, we'll share some of that data with you all kind of moving forward. But uh, I would like to say that I agree with everything that everyone has said is that you need to make sure you are good to go um, before you have the resources to make sure your students are good to go. So we only got a couple more minutes. I want to make sure that if anyone else has a question or a comment that they have the opportunity to make it. And if you're shy or not in a position where you can kind of unmute, if you put it in the chat, I'll read it for you. So I'll also say too, I'm on a teaching schedule where I have 20 minutes between uh, what, classes but that's right at the lunch hour. So other, if I skipped it, I wouldn't have it. And it's been a trick of like, and I even, I'm talking to them about it. It's like, I don't know what to do. So now we're swapping like overnight oatmeal recipes, <laughs> like, cause I have to be able to drink my lunch. Um, and I was like, check out this portable smoothie maker I got. And so we're, we're, we end up talking about it because another student is like, yeah, I'm in class from 1130 to five. And so I've got to figure out ways to end up eating. And I was like, I'm having the same issue. Here's what I'm figuring out. Um, this has been the best of like, Amazon has these great smoothie straws, <laughs> um, whatever it is, right? We're, we're swapping ideas on how to problem solve when you have back-to-back -back teaching or, um, and I don't want to skip it. I know it's a terrible idea for me to skip a meal. I'm going to end up hangry. I'm going to end up hating everyone. And I don't want to do that. So I know I have to attend to that need. Other people, other students with back-to-back -back schedules also have these needs to attend to. And we, you know, so we talked about how we were problem solving that. Um, because it's, it's important that we, because I brought my snack to, to class one day, my little veggie straw bag. Um, so, you know, just being transparent too, like I'm trying to figure out how to solve this physical need problem with this schedule. And uh, that is a, a good thing to be cognizant of. I realize that a lot of us have to attend to our physical needs, for instance, before our one o'clock meetings. <laughs> so if people don't have other pressing questions, I'll probably leave it there so that we have opportunity to get a snack, take a bathroom break, whatever. So thank you so much. I'm going to put a post event survey um, in the in the chat for you to check that out. I'll remind you next week, we have a teaching chat um, where you get to bring in questions, concerns. As I said, I'll have some of your, if you're worried you don't have one, you shouldn't come. Believe me, we will have stuff to talk about. We will have experiences, strategy, tips, recommendations, and all of that to share. So I look forward to seeing you next week. But before we conclude, I want to one more time thank the wonderful Dr. Tracy Brimhall from English for sharing us her thoughts about the student body and how to take care of it. Thank you, Tracy. Thanks, Don. And thank you all for being here every Wednesday at noon. We have our PD series. Please check us out. Hopefully we'll see you again. And I hope you have a great rest of your day.